sorry, welcome to our presentation on music and uh, special education. Today, we're super excited to have Susan Van Wick with us. And if you are a um, follower of our brand new podcast, you'll know that Miss Van Wick was recently, actually, she was in our inaugural presentation of the podcast, mm -hmm. More Able Than This. And you can find all of the recordings of our professional development and our podcasts in our YouTube channel. So um, I hope that you'll go like and subscribe and you'll be able to to see new information as it drops. But we're super excited, Miss Van Wick. I'll turn it over to you. All right. I realize you're seeing my screen and not me, but um, my name is Susan Van Wick and I am currently an access teacher at Heard Elementary in Bibb County. Access is what used to be called um, self-contained special ed. However, my background is in music, which is where I met Dr. Davis. And um, I had this idea about including students in special specials classes, um, electives, music classes, basically. Um, I have a little bit of a PowerPoint and I've been messing with it constantly. So if it's a little, we'll see how it goes. Um, is everyone here a music major or have a background in music? And if so, band or chorus or orchestra? Um, you can put it in the chat. Let me see. Um, Tashea is band slash general music. Okay. Victoria is chorus. Middle school chorus. Wimberly is chorus and band. Wimberly, I think, is music therapy also. Oh, you go, girl. Yeah. Um, let's see, we are still popping up. Okay. My background is in band. So a lot of the things I talk about will be related to instruments. Um, however, it would apply to or I've taught orchestra, chorus, you know, similar things like that. So um, the last two, Kelsey is chorus and music therapy, and mm -hmm. Solange majored in music, if I recall correctly, piano, and is now focusing in chorus in the MAT program. Okay. You know, all right. So, yeah. Alrighty. So can, everyone can see my screen, I think. Or did I mess it up? Alrighty. Um, so we'll go along with the presentation. It's very baseline of some things, and I will have some other um, documents that I'll pull up a little bit later. I'll also email to this once I decide I like it to Dr. Davis if you need a reference. Um, but to start off with, this is including yourself and in inclusion. Let me get that there. Okay. Come on. There we go. All right. So here's our overview. I talk fast, so don't worry. Um, we'll have a, a little bit of an introduction. What is inclusion? special ed types, legal-ish mumbo jumbo. I am not a lawyer. I can just tell you basically the have tos. And then a little bit of discussion of elementary, middle and high school requirements. And then I have some suggestions for simple accommodations. We'll open it up for some questions. And then of course the pop quiz. Um, <laughs> have to have a pop quiz. Um, we, um, Dr. Davis will monitor the chat. So if so, you raise your hand for a question, we'll do that. I will ask if you have a question about a specific student or a situation, let's hold those to the end just because I'll have a lot of questions to get an overview. But if I say something and you're like, huh, we'll, we'll of course stop then for questions. All righty. Um, so about me, um, I'm originally from South Louisiana. I hide the accent, but I do tend to talk fast. So if I'm uh, rattling along a little too fast, you know, raise a hand or, you know, a white flag or something, and I'll slow down just a little bit. Um, I came to teaching special ed kind of um, roundabout way. It was not my intention. I had always wanted to be a band director. I have a bachelor's and a master's in music education from the University of Southern Mississippi. Um, when I graduated, I bypassed the state of, I didn't want to go to Louisiana, it's hot, tired of Mississippi, totally skipped Alabama and ended up in Georgia. Um, here I've taught different levels of elementary, middle, I've done high school band camps and um, of general music, chorus, orchestra, band. 
during that time, particularly when I taught middle school, um, I noticed there was a lot of special ed kids in my class. I was like, huh, she does just fine on the clarinet. I had no idea they had a reading disability. Or, you know, the trombone section looks like they're doing all right. Yeah. And it was interesting to me. So I kind of looked into it. And then I got certified in special ed. I just kind of kept that under my hat. But then when I was ready to leave the Atlanta area, um, I got a job in special ed. And I've, I've kind of, I've liked it. I've gone back to music and then back and forth a couple times, but I really think the two go well together. Those of you in music therapy are like, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, that wasn't quite as common. Music therapy though has existed. It was, it, you didn't see it as much um, as a form of therapy. So I, I figured out I liked it. Now there is one other part to it that, um, I'm the oldest of four children, and my youngest brother is um, severe, profound autistic. He is in his 30s. He has an independent living with a like a caregiver that lives with him. So he has his own place. Um, he's nonverbal, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means, but predominantly he doesn't talk. Um, if you see him, he looks like any other guy, but he has some of the motions and the um, stemming that other people did. My, myself and my other siblings were all band nerds, somewhere in the gifted and just kind of weird. So that was very different for my family. So I had a vested interest in special ed in the schools because of my brother. So that's kind of how I ended up where I am now. And how I think that music is beneficial to students with disabilities. And I personally believe that students with disabilities or differing abilities are very beneficial to music programs. You know, everyone's a little different in, in band as it is, and we do different things. The clarinet, like you don't want to hear me try to play a saxophone. It sounds like a dying goose, but some people play it lovely. And that's different. If you were to say I'm saxophone disabled, there you go. So seeing other people that have differences like that, I think also just blends well with music. So, all right, next slide. So what is inclusion? The definition of inclusion is the state of being included. So something that is included, um, a gaseous liquid included, I included this for you, temporary product cell activity, you know, this, you got to get the science in there. And then the, no, the third one is the act or practice of including students with disabilities with the general student population. This has also been called mainstreaming, um, sharing, co-teaching, um, resource, different school systems call different things. But it's basically including students and in other classes with their general education peers. Um, that's a little different than we have um, a music class just for the special ed class. Like if they go to um, music appreciation just with their little class and they experience music education there, that's not inclusion. You've included them in your schedule, but you haven't included them with other students their age approximately and how they would interact with them as well. Um, inclusion in some cases, the students are actively participating. This is something they can work on. Think PE, art. In some cases, music, different things like that. Sometimes it's also just social, which is a big part of special ed. Um, last year, I had two fifth graders that went to fifth grade science with a regular science class. Did they understand everything that was going on? No. Did they take the same tests? that the other fifth graders did? No, I did their tests and it was mainly like matching things or like, do you remember talking about this? You know, do magnets pull things towards them or push them away? A simplified version, but they loved it. They had their own friends, their little groups and all that. And that's just as important for inclusion as the academic part. All right. This, when I did this, it was on my smart panel, so it came out much bigger, but I'll do um, go over this quick quickly. Um, and this is the part of who belongs in special ed. 
one of the things um, that you'll notice when you start teaching, if you already haven't, is how much schools have changed, even in the four to six years, something me a little bit more, of being in college. Like, you're like, dude, we didn't get to do that. Why does she have a cell phone? You know, if I had talked to my teacher that way, or, you know, why do they get to leave for lunch? Or what do you mean you can't leave for lunch? Just things that are different. And I promise you, way back when I was a little Miss Van Wick, special ed was like, you know, they divided our classes. So if there was three fourth grade classes, there was kind of the, the A-level class, the B's, C's, and then the students that couldn't keep up with that went to special ed. And I promise you, and Dr. Davis can probably agree, it seemed like those kids just disappeared and we never saw them again. Usually down a dark hallway at the end of the building. You know, you know the band, the band rooms at the end, sometimes separate. Behind that, there was a trailer. And then you never saw them again. You didn't know why, quite, quite why they were there. Some were obvious. Sometimes it was physical disabilities, wheelchairs. You can tell how someone walks. And sometimes you're like, I, I don't know what he did to get in there but he's there. <laughs> and mm -hmm. that's changed a lot. Um, you know, eligibility, these are the categories that I, I know is probably hard to read. Um, there's different eligibility categories. Not everyone stays in special ed forever. And also some people start elementary school in particular in general ed, and they kind of hit a wall with their academic development. So then maybe they are in a special ed class for some things. Some people have a reading disability, but they're like Stephen Hawking's in math. So they don't have to go to all special ed classes. But um, some of the um, categories are autism spectrum disorder. That's a big one. Again, I mentioned that my brother has autism and there's a saying in special ed that if you've met one autistic person, you've just met one autistic person. That's true. So there, there, there's so many differences. You can't. Yeah. Um, and that covers a lot. They, they used to be a little stingier with immediately qualifying for autism spectrum disorder. But they're um, they're getting a little I, I'm, I'm seeing more students that um, are qualified under autism spectrum. Um, however, just because you have autism doesn't mean you're in special ed. Another example is if you watch the Big Bang Theory, Sheldon, totally autistic, but he wouldn't need to be in my class. And we'll talk about that some more as well. Um, deaf, blind, deaf, hard of hearing. The other kind of controversial or big one now is EBD, emotional behavioral disorder. The joke is, no, really, they're BAD, but this is different. You know, this is this is not someone who's acting up or whatever. This is a disorder um, um, that they have that they can't necessarily control either with self-regulation or medication. So it goes, you know, it goes a little beyond that. And that is a, a growing category that we see in special ed. Orthopedic impairment, obvious. Um, other health impairment, you know, just anything. Um, I usually say... Um Sorry, I've usually seen that ADHD is the biggest other health impairment that I've noticed. What do you think? I think so as well. And a lot of times you don't you can't qualify for special ed because of ADD. You don't. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly since in some ways it's treatable with medicine, it, it can go away or at least be managed where mm -hmm. with other eligibilities in special ed, it doesn't go away. Um, usually. Um, mm -hmm. ironically, um, students with special ed, if they have services through Medicaid, I think it's Medicaid, have to recertify that they're eligible for it. And I had a parent who's like, I guess they just think she's going to come back next year and not have Down syndrome, but they make us do it every year. And it's, you know, but um, other health impairment can come and go. And it just depends. Significant mm -hmm. de de developmental delay. This is usually younger students. Um, like pre-K to second grade. And basically it's like, we don't know, but but there's something. Might be ADD, might be a language barrier. And once we get through that, might be a health something. Um, that one you really won't see past um, second or third grade because by the time you are eight, they have to do more testing to determine, you know, is it this disorder? Is it a learning disorder? Is it something else? So it's kind of a catch-all. 
speech language impairment, um, visual impairment, and I skipped over one, traumatic brain injury. This is one that um, to me can be scary because you know, you're know a high school football player that's in too much of a tackle and there's an injury. He's now in special ed. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, you know, um, teachers that teach that, there's a lot that goes with it because it was sudden. You know, mm -hmm. you didn't know before they were born. You didn't have counseling as you were pregnant. You didn't find out through the school and go through 13 years of, you know, disorder um, meetings and this and this and this. You just woke up and this happened. That's what so happened that's, to me. Yeah. Yes. And um, some people, you know, they're in special ed while we're doing that. And then some people aren't. But that that's a particularly difficult one a lot for families. And yeah, if it's like me. Um, if it's like me, when you have a traumatic brain injury, you also tend to also have something in one of the other categories. For instance, I also have an orthopedic impairment now because of the way I move. Mm -hmm. But different people have different things. Yeah. And a lot of people, you don't have to just go with one. Obviously, people qualify for others, but sometimes it's the major thing that we're working on or their major um, category. For example, a lot of students that are, are autism. Once they get towards special ed, we do more testing, and then they also might have autism and moderate intellectual disability. Sure. Showing that they do function below grade level, but we're also dealing with someone on the autistic spectrum. Gives a bigger picture. Right. The other thing um, about that can... Go ahead. Sorry, for Shay, to Shaya put in the chat that she has two years of experience working in a traumatic brain injury rehab center. So um, for her, working with special ed students relates a lot to how we would work at clients at rehab. Yeah. It, it, All right, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for your work because that, that, that's hard. <laughs> you know, I, I've always been amazed by Dr. Davis we, back when we were baby teachers. But, um, you know, seeing what she has done after what a lot of people have been like, you know, that's it. On, and how her life has changed. But not only does she do what she loves, she has branched out to see that other people that might have differing abilities can also do it. So you guys are in a good class. OK. <laughs> um, with eligibility, like I said, the dark hallway behind the band room and then you never saw the kid again. That doesn't happen anymore. We, you have to be requalified for special ed or we review it every year. At least every three, three years, we do a whole nother battery of tests to see where we are. So it's not like you stutter in second grade and then you're special ed forever. We reevaluate, we review, we go over it again. Um, like I said, some people, you know, move on. My sister had speech therapy, though that's not special ed. That's sec technically different because she had a lisp. And I think it was like two years and that's it. It's not like it counted against her on, you know, college. I've, oh, she was special ed. No, you know, it's to help the student there. Um, the other thing is including um, health impairments, um, ADHD disorders, anything like that. When dealing with a school, we are concerned with how it affects how you learn and your placement in the school. This can be diff difficult when explaining things like the, um, orthopedic impairments and stuff like that. If you walk with a limp or have a cane or a walker, you might get um, physical therapy outside of school, but you're doing okay functioning in the building. Are we gonna put you on the track team or you know, across the street by yourself in the middle of New York? No, there's precautions and you know, just common sense. However, you, you don't really need to be in special ed for that. ADD is another one. Um, if you have your medication, a lot of kids are okay. Autism, you're a little quirky, but you function. There's another kind of sister to special education placement, which is called the 504 plan, which is basically a medication plan saying, hey, this kid, you know, has this, but with medication, it's handled. If it gets out of control, we can readjust. Maybe we need some more services, but for the most part, they're all, all right. The example I use for this is glasses or visual impairment. Um, just about everyone knows someone with glasses, correct? If you have glasses, you don't need to be in special ed. 
you know, you don't necessarily have to go to the Georgia School for the Blind all of a sudden, just because you're, you know, particularly as you get older, if your vision decreases, like, oh, no, she's blind. Get her a dog. She can walk now, you know, just you don't. It's how you um, function in your environment. So that leads me to my next point, if I haven't jumped around too much. Oh, there we go. I'll go back. I'll stay here. Yeah. Um, the special ed types, we talked about that. Um, the thing that you need to know is least restrictive environment, or LRE. When people ask about special ed students and um, general education classes, they're like, okay, so I didn't even know, like I said, I had no idea some of my students were in special ed when I was teaching middle school band. I was like, oh, really? Okay, didn't know that. And some of them only went to, got pulled out for reading. What I teach is my students are with me all day. That's not as common as it used to be. In general, we want students in their least restrictive environment. What that means is like I said with our friend with glasses, you just have glasses. Do we need glasses, contacts, a seeing eye dog, a cane, and this? No, she just needs glasses. That's it. Maybe later on she needs different glasses or something else, but glasses will do it for right now. Or we're just going to move you up so that you're not in the back of the auditorium for this class. So least restrictive environment is what we're going for. Which means, like if a student has a reading difficulty, they'll have a, a teacher come in and help them with reading. They do okay in math. Those are the um, co-teaching, um, inclusion, and the word is escaping me right now. In interrelated, thank you. Interrelated. Those are students that for the most part travel with their grade level. You know, they might have some um, de deficits in some things or whatever, but, you know, they just have special help not all the time, it can come and go as they need it, um, and that's it. My students are with me all day. We're talking, they're at least two to three grade levels behind. An example is I have two second graders and we're still working on matching and saying colors, um, shape, like pre-K skills. There's a lot of other things we're working on socially, developmentally, um, speaking um, both of them are nonverbal so getting them to use their voice as well so that that's a little different than someone who just needs help with math what that looks like in um, different levels of um, school is a little bit different but let me check my notes and make sure does anyone have any questions so far Um, all right, so one of the things that I'm asked is like, okay, well, this kid, I didn't even know they were in special ed. This kid came in with two pair of pros and they kept them in the back and nobody moved. You know, your class came in with seven kids and just kind of sat in the back. Some of them played with us, some did something else. That goes with least restrictive environment. Um, my class, when we travel to a gen ed class, there will always be a teacher or a pair of pro with them. Always. I, I would never in my class just go, all right, they're with you for an hour and head out. Like a spe in elementary, like when the teacher leaves, no, we can't do that, we stay. In some cases, students need someone to stay with them. Sometimes this is just for the good of the order. I know that I need to keep a very close eye on this student, so I'm going to. Officially having someone assigned to a student or a one-on-one -on -one para pro doesn't happen very, very often. And a lot of times it's due to medical, um, feeding tubes, things like that, and um, that, that they would need someone with them all the time. But we still want them to be included in classes, which is why sometimes somebody just, you know, comes in with the other class and you're like, okay, sometimes we make a grand entrance. Sometimes we only do certain things. At the moment, my class only participates in PE as a special. We also, just because of because we have to send someone with them, my class ranges from kindergarten to third grade this year. I can teach K to five, 
but I have all little babies this year. It, last year I had some really big fifth grade boys, so it just seems like everyone shrunk. But um, <laughs> um, but we go with a second grade class instead of everyone going with their individual ones because that would, you know, having the staffing to do all of that, and I'd never keep up with four different schedules. We picked one that's kind of in the middle with our peers, and we go with them. At the moment, with how my kids um, function in school, they love to sing, but doing a formal music class is going to be very distracting to the other students and the poor teacher. As a former music teacher, I'm like, I understand. Art, some of them like to color, but we're not as organized and particularly as a specials teacher, what you do is important. They're not there just to color on the table. You're teaching a class. My kids aren't quite there. My school has agriculture as a special. Um, again, that one's a lot of reading and writing. We don't do that. But if they go look at the chickens that day, we join. If they're doing something in the garden, we join. Um, and then, But PE is something we can do. So we do that every day. Um, we blend in with the kids. Some of them that have, you know, aren't as physical, don't. They kind of do their own thing, but they're in there with those students. We also have recess with a general ed class and um, meals. We have lunch in the regular lunch room. In the past, my class has eaten in our room just because of logistics and just it can be very noisy in a cafeteria or gym. And, and that's just not always great, particularly with students on the autism spectrum. You know, you have someone that won't eat because they're going loud, loud. So we ate in our room. Um, in the mornings, we have breakfast with the pre-K students, which is always interesting because this is their first introduction to school. And then there's my class. And I do have students who have vocal stimming where they just kind of yell something. Um, and my nonverbal kids. I encourage all of my kids to speak. If you've ever been around someone who does use sign language and they are deaf, um, a lot of times when they're learning, they still use their voice. And it sounds different to us because it sounds different to them. And you get used to it. Like, um, it's kind of like if you have your own kid, you know what they said, but your friend is like, I, I don't know what she just said to me. You know, do you want, um, what do you want for lunch? Peba. I know she meant peanut butter. Uh, but, you know, I've known her for three years. Everyone else is like, what is a pee book? But it's peanut butter. The pre-K kids, this is all new to them. And my class can be a lot. And it's interesting to me to see how at first they're a little scared of us. You know, they're like, I don't know what to do with this. You know, we're a smaller class. We're clearly all different ages. We have some that move a little differently. I had one that um, every once in a while just takes off running and, and comes back, the screaming, things like that. So at first, they're a little scared. By about Thanksgiving, you'll actually hear some of them go, oh, no, that's a happy scream. It's, he's OK. He's not upset. And they just get used to us, which is what we want to happen is just have them included like anybody else. All right. So the legalish mumbo jumbo. Every student that is in special education has an IEP, which is their individual education, individualized education plan. Um, those are updated annually. They have to be attended by the parent, um, the student, if they are able, a general ed teacher, and they um, usually have a special, a special ed teacher, excuse me, and a general ed teacher. A lot of times the general ed teacher that they pull into the meeting is going to be one of you because they see you. I mean, my students, since they stay with me all day, I can bring in a third grade teacher, you know, to help this, you know, discuss like what this student can do versus what's expected in a general third grade class, but they don't know him. But you know who does? The coach. That's initially another one of the reasons I got interested in special ed is because since I guess I'm special ed friendly, having a brother in special ed. When the special ed teachers had an IEP meeting and needed someone to sit in, they're like, oh, Ben Wick will do it. Sure. Even with students who I didn't necessarily see all the time because they weren't in my band, if I saw them around or knew whatever, they're like, no, sh she'll come sit in. So, hi, Jay. <laughs> so a lot of times you'll see um, 
that's that's how you'll get to know some of your students are in special ed at all because they have that IEP meeting. Um, that is when they decide what services, accommodations, and modifications they need to be successful in school. To, and and the, of course, the least restrictive environment, LRE, those are important. Special ed loves a good acronym. Like I've, I've had a conversation with someone where there were like two words and just letters and I'm like, but they love it. So what this is what they decide is what services you need. Um, technically speaking, accommodations and modifications are different, but they get used interchangeably a lot. Um, accommodations are things that do not change the curriculum. That'd be somebody's glasses. We've made an accommodation. Okay, you can wear those so that you can see. Modifications are when I change the curriculum to make it accessible to my students. This is like my second graders that are doing shapes. Well, we don't add and subtract very well, but we can count. So we'll, we'll do it with shapes or it's on their level. I introduce it to them, but I know darn well, we're not gonna be multiplying by Christmas like other second graders. However, we do activities or kind of introduce it to them. I am changing the curriculum or modifying it. That's what qualifies someone for a self-contained class is modifying the curriculum. However, in specials, you don't need to modify the curriculum, but that's where you get to the accommodations. And let me see if I do this right. I was going to pull up. Nope, that one's not it. You're no longer sharing your screen. Oh, okay. Give me a second. I'll find it. Da, da, da. Maybe not. I believe in you. Okay. Was it this one or this one? Nope. All right. I had a I had bookmarked a picture of the. Come on. Ah, oh, here we go. I'll, I'll I will share. It. Yes, yes, I will reshare now that I have found it. Old people in technology. Um, fun fact, while I struggle with this, is um, I have lived in Macon now for 10 years, but I still have an uh, Atlanta area phone um, number. So do we. Yeah, and the reason is because anytime I think about explaining to my dad how to change the phone number in a cell phone, <laughs> I'm like, you know what? It, it, it can just stay here. So... <clears throat> just that process I'm like uh, no all right so these mm -hmm. are allowable accommodations for students with disabilities um, this goes way into more detail but I'll just kind of hit the highlights this is what we did discuss at the IEP meeting that are kind of standard uh, and these of course are for testing specifically state testing um, my students because we are modified don't take um, milestones we have the Georgia alternate assessment, which is, again, it approaches their grade level curriculum with accommodations and modifications that allow them to be successful. I read the test to them. Um, if we if they answer a question that's wrong the first time, we reread the passage and try again. And if not, then there's another level of support. Totally different than milestones, but a, a Approximate, no, appropriate for my students and their success. Here's some of the standard accommodations. They're setting accommodations. Special ed classroom, excuse me, adapted lighting for our friend with the glasses. See, now she's got glasses and a light, you know. Oh, I also have an interesting sense of humor. I think most of us have figured out. I, yeah, so please don't take offense. I just add things on. Um, preferential most seating. With, yeah, most people oh. with disability or that work with disability do have a special sense of humor, and I think it's a survival mechanism. I think so too. Will you send I'm this okay. to me? I've never seen this. I will. I will. This Thank is you. one of the most um, inclusive ones that I've found. I was I had intended to show you the page and go IEP, the program I use to write it our IEPs, but I couldn't find one that had everything without making a fake one so 
and I, I can't, I didn't want to share anyone's personal information. So yeah, this is, this is actually great. I was like, Ooh, um, but this is for state testing, setting accommodations are where you take the test. Adaptive furniture, individual study carol, um, uh, let's see, test admin administered by a certified educator familiar with the student. Fun fact about that one, because people looked at that and go, what? Particularly when the cheating accountability kind of thing, that you know, you can't test your class. That really throws special ed students sometimes. Like my mother taught um, reading resource before she retired and she had a student. And when they started all this testing thing, he had to go take the test with somebody. She's like, well, you just do your best. It'll be OK. And they did not have modified curriculum. They took the, the standard test. And the little boy came back and the um, test person was just kind of like, he didn't really answer anything. He didn't do anything. And he's just standing there. When she left the room and he was just there with my mom, he said, I didn't tell that lady nothing. Because apparently, you know, snitches get stitches with ELA homework or something. And but he was very proud that he had not let it slip that he can read. And he I think he was third grade, it's, you know, but that's important to special ed students that they know someone they might not talk to you. I have, you know, a student now in kindergarten new to me. She she won't talk to me. She She's nonverbal, but she just if, if I come around her shuts down. Completely. So that can be a big thing with testing, particularly now that sometimes you show up and they just send you to somebody's room with someone you don't know. Um, present presentation accommodations, large print, um, some of the sign the directions, sign the test questions, and um, sign the reading passages. Those are all different because if it's a reading test, I want you to read the passage. So if I sign the directions, you know, read the passage, then you read it depending on your um, level of um, disability or what kind of support you need, I might also be able to sign the passage to you. So I'm basically reading it for you. Most of my kids have a read aloud accommodation. These days with testing being online, a lot of them have it built in. You know, you hit it and it reads it for you. And um, there's adapted communication and things for that, but that is very different. There's lots of discussion about, okay, do we need to read the reading passage to them or with them in order for them to answer the questions? Um, explain, paraphrase the directions. Sometimes, you know, if you're ever given a standardized test, you can only read what's in the teacher book. That one means I can explain. They mean to circle it, honey, or you're looking for the main idea. You know, you can, you, yeah, that's different. Braille, of course. Um, color overlays and templates, people with visual discernment issues, like we have the, it almost looks like a little clear ruler or a clear highlighter so you, they can focus on what line they're using. Some of these are very formal and sometimes it's just so much as like you have an extra piece of paper. So when they read, they pull it down so they don't get overwhelmed looking at the whole thing. It's kind of like if you read with your finger, you know, something like that. Um, presentations, oh, they can use a highlighter. Um, low vision aids, a lot of those are for things that people that have, you know, documented hearing or vision um, impairments, and they would need that. You know, if you read Braille and they hand you a regular test book, that's not going to work. Um, sign language interpreter. If you have a sign language interpreter, they have to have one. Even if the kid just moved in, because I've had this happen a week before testing, you got to have an interpreter. He does not take the test without the interpreter. We're not gonna just see how he does, just lip reading or sitting close to the teacher. You have to have it. So this is what I meant by legal mumbo jumbo. You can't go, oh, that's close enough. No, it is not. Um, response accommodations. Um, this is when, um, and it's not as big a deal now because most everything is on the computer. But when it was um, the little bubbles, you know, students that have um, limited ability in a hand or um, dysgraphia or something like that, you know, you didn't want to see that Scantron. It was not going through. So um, student marks answers in the test booklet, um, points to answers. I have a lot of students that do that. And then I write them in or I, for GAA, they tell me the answer and I click it in the computer. 
um, a braille writer, a scribe. Um, scribe is usually the teacher, but like for a writing passage or something, they say it, someone else can write it or type, I think, I think they can type it for them. Some of these you really have to clarify. And as we use more technology for these standardized tests, it's not really an issue, you know. Is, is that something where they could speech to text and they could just say it to the computer and the computer could write it? Right now, most tests don't have that, but it's going that way. But again, it's not for everyone. You can't just go, I ain't writing this and hit it. It would be for someone who has the accommodation. Other, otherwise, it's cheating. And it's, it's, it gets really picky with some of the things like, can I repeat the directions? Can I do that? The teacher manual. An abacus. I can't imagine why in the fresh heck anyone would still have an abacus. Um, but a, a lot of people um, in the school for the blind, they use it because it's tactile. You can move it. Um, though it's not in here, I can use the same manipulatives that I use in class for my students test. If we count the little plastic teddy bears and that's how they do their math, she gets plastic teddy bears for the test. Yeah, so that's how those come in. Um, basic function calculator. And um, you know, that's your just your standard. Like I know how to set up the problem, but we don't need me to take 50 minutes because it's hard for me to addition and I'm dyslexic and I switched it and now I'm freaking out and I don't wanna do this. So if you read the word problem and kind of set it up, then you get the calculator to do that. Um, adapted and lined paper, um, you know, in the test booklet, they just either have that blank space or the little bitty lines. Um, you can have the wider ruled paper. Adapted paper really just has like every other line highlighted, highlighted so it's easier to see. Um, all right, and then scheduling accommodations. Um, when I first saw all the accommodations for special ed kids, I'm like, it really just kind of seems like, you know, the student concierge. I want to make sure they're comfortable where they are. Do you have all your props? You know, you know, do you have everything you need? You got a water bottle. You got a pencil. Do you have your adapted pencil? Is this computer right for you? And, you know, I'm like, you're making them comfortable. And um, but it is testing stressful. And some of these help them get past the if to do to really show what they can do. If you know, like the, um, wh where you can hold the paper so you only read one line at a time. If a kid looks at an entire page, that's it. I ain't reading all that, they're done. So those things take away those barriers so we can really see what they can do, which is why they're pretty picky. However, a lot of them aren't gonna apply to band unless, or music, unless like you have to blow their music up. That's reasonable. Um, so a lot of it is just practical things with um, oh, test, um, testing with somebody familiar to the student. So if you have a new assistant director and for pass offs, you might say, hey, buddy, um, why don't we do you can do your pass off with me and I'll show Miss um, Davis how we do this because we've done this before and that way she'll know how we do it. Great. Then when they're comfortable with the other teacher, they can. Or, you know, back in the day when you had to do pass offs to your section leader, that might not be the greatest idea for a special, they're, they're gonna be nervous, scared, they don't understand it. You know, it's, it's different. Now, if they've known their section leader since birth, they were BFFs, perhaps. But it might be that that accommodation in your class means that you, you do their pass offs. That's reasonable. Um, but the scheduling accommodations, those happen with just about everything. Frequent monitored breaks. That can be different because once a student knows they get a break, I need a break. Question two, I need a break. Um, and they will at first, but you, you kind of have to go with it or you can negotiate a little like, are you sure you need a break or can we do two? Um, for my students, I use a Skittle method where um, I line up the Skittles. So we have four Skittles and then you get a break. So you answer or, or how did I do it? It was something else. Oh, oh, uh, Hershey's Kiss. So you got three Skittles for each one for each question. And then you got a break because you have to unwrap the Hershey's Kiss. And then we do that one. Then I lay out three more. So that's how I handled it in my class. It might be instead of passing off the entire marching band, you know, music, they do the first part. Maybe the next day they do it. Maybe the next day they do that. 
things like that. Optimal time of day for testing. I have students who are raring to go in the morning. They are great. And right after lunch, that, that's it. They're like, why am I still here? I did, I did my stuff. Or the opposite. I literally have had students who sleep until almost lunch. And then we work. And if you know this about your student, you can accommodate that way. Extended time. Um, and uh, um, extended time has variations. Extended time up to twice the normal time. Extended time up to the end of the day. Um, extended time indefinitely. That's not that often because at some point there has to be, a, okay, we we'll stop. Those are the ones that when you're dealing with a music class, how do I do that? Does that mean he gets to play it slower? Um, what if he doesn't keep the tempo? Is that, does he get, you know, extended time for each measure or something? You know, just what does that mean? Well, that means that if pass offs are on Friday, he, he can try Friday and maybe Monday. Or, you know, Fridays are bad days. He has speech, OT, PT. They didn't have pizza in the cafeteria anymore. Friday is not the day to do that. We can do something else extended time. If you have to have all of your marching band music or all of your um, words memorized for the concert by this date, th this student might have until, you know, a week after the concert. Sounds weird, but it just takes that mm, off of it so that they're going to do better. And extending sessions over multiple days. That's like I said, with marching band music, we do one piece today, one piece tomorrow. Um, so all of those, and that explains all the readings. All of those are accommodations for state testing. Um, when you get a special ed student, you should have an accommodations page for every single student in your class that has some sort of special ed services. Now, if they just have speech, um, you know, they have a, um, a speech disorder, maybe not. Um, you might not have accommodations for that because it really doesn't affect it. Um, 504 students, or if they have medication, you might not get it. But in everyone else, and I pulled up the page, let me see if I can find it. Yeah. Um, uh, this is not a, an official IEP. This is the one that we use. Come on. Yeah, yeah. This is um, the training page for the Go IEP system. This is not an actual student. This just gives you an idea of what it would look like. It would say student supports, and these are the supports that happen in addition to the testing supports. So testing supports, yeah. Testing supports would be an official one like here, like I just showed you on that big old sheet, and those carry over into classroom and other testing. And so sometimes you might not get that if you're doing, um, if you don't do standardized testing, but you, you would get this one, and it'll have the student's name. You don't need to know all that. You just have all that. So every single specials teacher has every single accommodations page like this from all of my students. I told you we only go to PE, but we might go see the chickens with, um, you know, the ag class one day. So she needs them. The bus driver, the parapro who helps us get our lunch. I'll be honest, even when I was a classroom teacher, they gave me these. And I went, OK, I signed the form and they went somewhere and that was about it. Because do they do they still in the electronic classroom? Mine used to, it was their name, and then I'd have little clicks. And so I'd have a click that said IEP, a click that said 504, a click that said they owe money to the library, whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you clicked on them, then the paperwork was there. I don't think ours shows that, shows the paperwork. I have to bring it. Okay. Um, I have access to the entire IEP. Typically, your general ed teachers, you you would have to ask, hey, can I see their, their entire IEP? I think um, that when I clicked a 504 or IEP, it just gave me the accommodation sheet, but it was yeah. in my in my electronic. I yeah, I don't think ours gives it to you, but I have to go around and personally give it to each specialist teacher or people that you know interact with my students and the teacher signs a little thing. I know as a as a music teacher, I signed a whole mess of them. And, and I probably couldn't have told you a certain one. I definitely did not read all of them. In general, you don't really have to until it affects a certain student. Some of them are obvious. And again, we don't do standardized testing. 
If you're a proctor or administering a standardized test, I assure you the special ed test, the special ed teacher has all of that other stuff together. They have their writer, they have this and this and this. However, this page also says, if you notice at the top, um, classroom, testing, um, classroom testing accommodations. So the same things they have for standardized tests have to be used there. So you can't just, you know, back in the day, throw them a piece, a, a handwritten test. No, I still have to have it read to me. I still have to have help with writing. But, you know, it's not that often that happens. And most of the time you'll know when my class goes to specials, we clearly are going to need some accommodations. Your standard sitting in the third row clarinet player who has a reading um, deficit, you might not know and in, but until you give a test, in which case you find out most students and teachers are like, they're not as mean as we seem, you know. Now, when dealing with the standardized test, yes, the state, mom, dad, everybody, Obama, and the dog and everyone will come down on you if you gave that test to that kid without his interpreter. There, the, It will be a legal case, literally. However, if I forgot that I'm supposed to paraphrase the directions and the test going over the features of art or, you know, the, the words for your um, the next song you're singing or, you know, the fingerings or fingering chart test or something like that. No. I, you know, I'm not going to have to go to court on that. I probably won't even get cussed out by their mom. It's just a, I'm sorry. Let's see how we can make you successful. And that really is all the teacher, student, and the parent want to do. You know, they're not saying you just have to, get, you know, like, how can I learn this? Or how can I show you I know this because I'm nonverbal? Hey, can you say the ABCs? Nope. Can you, if I say, is this an A? Is this a B? You know, there's ways to do it. Um, but it doesn't come up that often in your standard, you know, in elementary particular. Do they give tests and specials for elementary? I don't really think so. If we have a test, it's more like a, did the kid skip to the beat? Um, are they not a great skipper? Check minus. Did they yeah. sit in the you know corner? That's a zero. That kind of thing. Um, and here is where accommodation and modification is mean different things. Accommodations. That's my girl with the glasses. Modification. She doesn't have to do the same test. I'm testing it at her level. That's a modification. Most kids aren't gonna have a whole lot of those unless they're in my class. Um, instructional accommodations. That's um, if they have to have a copy of the PowerPoint, um, visuals, bigger books, things like that, audio speak, um, text to speech so they can respond, um, small group. You know, they're not going to do, you know, there's 40 people in the classroom. Um, hey, you, what's the answer to it? No, they'd work better if there's eight or, or lower. They just need that. They're more comfortable. Um, instructional modifications, again, um, my students use a modified curriculum. That's where you'll see that. This is also where um, if there's any other kind of training or something different, they have to do Braille. But you, you would know that. Those, I hate to say they're obvious, but it would be obvious. You know, you would kind of know, okay, that kid's going to need a little more support. Let me look at the accommodations. The, you know, there's a parapro that stays with him. I bet there's going to be something. Um, supplemental next. aids. Hmm? Sorry, in my experience, the para pro would hop in whenever they heard you say, this is what we're going to do next week. They'd hop in and say, okay, now remember that, you know, George needs this and this and this. Yeah, it is. Or, or again, we do it differently. Um, mm -hmm. We know, like, like I said, we do go outside to see the chickens. We have the rooster crows. That's the greatest, you know, or if they're doing something in the garden. So I know in advance. I also know in advance when there's a fire drill because loud, scary noises. Um you know, things like that. So we can go over it again. So it's not as scary, which I know sounds like, hey, don't you need, just need to know how to do it? It's like, yes, but they, I need to know so that what I'm doing, I can kind of wrap it up because, but, but I know those things as well. Supplemental aids and services. This is where you have speech therapy. Um, you might, they might have occupational therapy or physical therapy. Um, maybe they have, if they do have a pair pro that follows them the entire time, this is where the restrictive environment comes in. 
last year we had a student and this doesn't happen in Bibb County. You're either in access, self-contained or inclusion or an interrelated. The district he came from kind of had a half and half. So he came to access for math and some reading, but everything else was general ed. However, um, due to a physical disability, he um, had limited, was it, I can't think of it right now, but limited physical disability and um, movement and stuff, you know, be careful, um, needed assistance in bathroom, that kind of thing. So when he went to specials, does he need a parapro? Probably not. Well, for PE, maybe just for assistance or just to kind of keep an eye on in case he falls. You don't want all the kids to go, oh, no, we can't throw a basketball at him. You want him to go ahead and play. But you want someone there so that if he tries to dunk, like, no, nope, no, nope. let's bring that <laughs> down, Logan, you know, or or something like that. Does he need parapro assistance for art? Probably not. And if you think about it that way, that's your least restrictive environment. Now, sometimes a parapro, when that student moved to our school at first, yes, we sent a parapro everywhere he needed to go. Just to find out. Yeah. And then after speaking to him, previous teachers, parents, you know, like, I really think he'd be okay, but I would feel more comfortable. And um, if we had someone with him there for PE. Sure. And all of those decisions are made by the IEP team, which is where your general education teacher would be involved. Um, if they're, if we needed the physical therapist going, yeah, I don't think that's going to be a great idea or we need more support for this. Mm -hmm. So all of those things are what you would get when you're doing, um, when you're including special ed kids in your class. All right. I need a bottle of water. And so Thank I was going to take a sh short, like two minute break. Does anyone else need to go to the potty? And I promise I'm wrapping up. Um, it's up to you. We can either take a break or push on through because we're just about out of time. Okay. I'll go ahead and go on through. Um, okay. I'm looking. I got enough water. Yeah. All right. So um, I think I've covered elementary, middle, and high school requirements. And one of the reasons this whole thing came up to me is I remember inclusion and those things were kind of starting to be a thing when I was in college. And I remember a conversation, I want to say it was marching band methods. And it was, and the conversation really went, keep in mind, I have a special needs brother. They're like, so what do you do? I mean, you're about to go to BOA finals, BOA finals. And they say, no, you got to include the special ed kid. I mean, what are you going to do? I mean, you're not going to win. Uh, what, you know, how am I going to do that? And, and the rest of us were like, oh my goodness, that would just totally be awful. And I remember that conversation because clearly all of us at age 21, we're going to be in, you know, grand fi fam finals championships in East of Butchie, Mississippi. That was definitely going to happen. <laughs> but the idea that just someone would show up and go, hey, you got to take him. That, you know, and we were just fl frustrated with it and just like, what would you do? You know, how, how are you going to include this kid in a wheelchair and marching band? Just, you know, what are you going to do? And finally, I think the solution was something like, okay, they can play a symbol crash. What if there's no symbol? We're going to add a symbol crash. He's going to crash those symbols at the end. So everyone sees that I include it. He didn't go to band camp. He didn't do anything. We just tell him where to show up. And somebody goes, mm, and he crashes the symbols. Is that inclusion? Yeah. No, it isn't. Also, unless it was, I mean, and I hate to be like, morbid unless it was like a make-a-wish thing where the kid just really wanted to be in marching band once that's not going to happen they're mm -hmm. going to join band just like everyone else in middle school and sign up so you know this and just like you know band directors and music teachers we have our kids for three four years mm -hmm. i had a kid that moved on last year from fifth to sixth grade i knew his brother before so i technically knew this child since he was four and he's been in my class since he was five. I, I, you know, I'm aware of what he needs, not a hundred percent, but that's a long time, hmm. you know. Now, at the end of fifth grade, if they'd just thrown him in my room and said, "All right, he's going to perform with y'all," I would have been like, oh. "But that doesn't happen. It doesn't." And inclusion, they just want to. They really just want to be included. And by included, I mean I want to be part part of the band. You know, and include when you talk about inclusion with people, it's kind of interesting because like football fans, you can just choose. I like this team. I'm included. I am a so Seattle Seahawks fan. Have you been to Seattle? No. 
Have you seen a Seahawk? What's a Seahawk? No, you just do it. But in schools, you kind of have to be invited, do something, whatever they want to do it. Mm -hmm. And though it seems scary because there are lawyers, um, um, parents can have advocates come in and talk for their students and all of these things at IEP meetings that my college marching band class was terrified of. And it really isn't like that. They just want to try. I mean, is it possible that someone in my class, maybe not my nonverbal, are going to try out for band? Yeah, I, I encourage them to. We sing every day. For my nonverbal students, we sing the national anthem. There is not an actual word spoken or sung throughout the entire thing, but we're very close to pitch in most cases. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, you know, oh, happy birthday. We do a great one and there's not a single word. It's just <laughs> kind of the tune and they kind of make the sounds like they can't. So yeah, they are gonna be in band. And we yeah. just wanna know how we can try that. Are they gonna suck completely on trying to play the saxophone like I do? Maybe. Maybe. Or maybe they're good. And this is something mm -hmm. since they don't have to redo math or whatever. All I got to do is count to four. Yes, they'll be great. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the legal mumbo jumbo and what that would look like. Um, the next part, let me get to my slide. Am I still sharing this one? Yeah. yeah. Um, as it becomes autism in particular, and as people say neurodivergent, some of the kids are just have different needs and things in a classroom that are different than we did. And like I said, when you start teaching, you'll be like, whoa, school has changed. And COVID, I gotta say it really messed some things up and just kids didn't get stuff. It's just different. You know, it looked like I was, you know, the teacher was talking just to them. So this whole, who are these people in my space is new to a student who started school in COVID. Sure. Um, these are some things that I use with my students. These are visual cues. The official like name brand is PET, um, Picture Exchange C. I can't remember the C right now, but just any kind of picture. So that frequent monitored break, this one, he has a little card on his desk. If it's getting too much, he holds up the card. So your kid that does a test, I need, a, or, or even just in your regular class, it's a little too loud, there's downtime, I need a break. Some of them are reminders. Remind to stay quiet. This is one of the funny ones, clothes stay on. That's a thing. It is shoes, especially. You know, I have a student, it, I mean, if she's there for two seconds, she's kicking off her shoes. No hitting, no throwing. Again, those are more extreme behaviors, but they also go through phases. If I'm sitting next to Jim, Bob, and I don't like him every once in a while, if you're not looking, I'm going to go, you know, you didn't see that because I'm showing, showing my screen, but trust me, I hit Jim, Bob. So, um. All of those are remote hands to self, finish your work, no touching. Um, staying in your own personal space can be interesting for um, autist, autistic students a lot. Either they have a very clear defined sense of um, space or they don't. So they're either two inches away from you and sneeze at you, or if you're standing too close, they you know they can't handle it. But little signs like this on someone's music stand, remember to count to five if you're upset, use nice words. You know, you can't mess up your scale and then, you know, channel Samuel L. Jackson, you, you gotta go on and they might not have the regulatory skills to do that. So we have a reminder. Um, this next one I had considered, I think I said this one. Yeah, I'll, I'll skip this one. Um, I considered using a picture of um, Dr. Davis's husband and his band. Um, as a conductor and this the big eyebrows yeah this is um but then I, I got worried about what if I use a picture or whatever anyway clearly defined space for students and music we, you know particularly orchestras they sit really close together band tends to spread out um you know it's the thing so if you're the conductor here and someone comes in from the office to give you a note do they come and stand right next to you on the podium or do they stand next to the podium? They Most people would stand next to the podium. Unless you know them personally, you just don't step on it. And if someone did, you'd probably be like, ew. Because it's a clearly <laughs> defined space. You stepped mm -hmm. up on a box. It was defined. Students need that too. He's in my way. Well, how mm -hmm. do you know? So this is where I use duct tape. And um. 
my, my photography skills are legendary, but I have this little duct tape and this is that student space. So he's in my space. No, I wasn't. Did you step in inside the duct tape? Yes. Then you're in her space. Mm -hmm. It could be pretty big. Um, and the X is where she had to stop. Um, things like that. Stop signs. Don't touch that. The clearly defined space. That solves a lot of problems. I got it. And it's just duct tape. Sometimes it's bigger. Sometimes it's littler. But it's the same thing. If I come up to talk to this student, I can't stand in her box. I have to stand outside. Just like lady from office better not step on my podium to give me a phone message. That's just rude. Mm -hmm. So it's those things that can be a little more difficult. And as more students qualify as neurodivergent or whatever, these are things that are easy. Um, talk to your special ed teacher. Most of us are a little weird, but um, we have suggestions like this. I have duct tape in five different colors and patterns because sometimes kids just like a choice. So she picked her duct tape for her square. Um, when we label things, my students that can't read their names yet, they have an icon. So yours is Peppa Pig. So all of your things is labeled with Peppa Pig. You know, maybe you just don't like sitting next to that person. And as a band director, you're going, but if you're a saxophone player, you can't sit back there with the rest of your class, you know, but does it matter? You know, maybe for, you know, your top ensemble or something, but in general, it doesn't. So um, little things like that that we use in my class help. The little reminders are very good. Um, extra time, things like that can also help, even if a student isn't in special ed. Um, for me, like again, like I mentioned, the new assistant director giving the test. And sometimes it's how you word it. Like, oh, no, you don't know him. Or, you know, just like, hey, how about we do this together? Really and truly, most of my students just want to be included. They want to have the band shirt like everybody else. Does that mean they do something a little different? Probably. Now, back to my, um, my you know, my East Abuchi band and Nowhere, Mississippi. East Abuchi actually is a place in Mississippi that is clearly about to go to um, grand championships. And I have a kid that has a slight limp and you can see it when they march. Well, we're not going to win because he's there. No, you cannot hold someone's disability as something to mark down. Now, if half of your band was out of step, yes. If it was just that kid, they technically have to like put that aside. That because his accommodations would go with that. So you're not so going to lose any hmm? Do you put a note to the judges that you have a student that's a wheelchair user, or you have a student who has an orthopedic, you know, whatever, you so that they know? You can, yes. It doesn't need a great explanation because the and it is more just. common. These days, people know, and we're not saying don't watch the back row. We're saying, we're hey, just saying this one person, yeah, yeah, because you know, particularly when you're dealing with top competition, because we all are. Um, you know, there there are little bitty differences, and so if a judge, you know, notice there's that one trumpet that just isn't in step the entire show. Okay, well, if it's just a, a poor little baby that just isn't the greatest marcher, that's one thing. Hmm. If it's that student that has accommodations, you know, okay, you notice it and you move on. We're not going to comment it on it again. You know. Yeah, Tashina um, just said there's a person with prosthetics that marches for Jack Jack State. Oh, really? Yeah. It, it's so. become, the prosthetics and stuff like that are just amazing. And again, you know, it's that's not going to be the reason you didn't win Intergalactic Marching Band of the Year. <laughs> it can't be held against you. And you know, it, it, but it's also something that doesn't need to be mentioned a lot. Like sure. we didn't win because of him. That's yeah. not what we're going for. It's just, it is what it is. Um, so just finding ways to include these students because of my background and I'm gonna stop sharing this for now. Because of my background and my brother um, throughout my interesting teaching career, um, I look for ways to include these students. Um, mm -hmm. I, at one point, one of my schools, I was itinerant, had the deaf, hard of hearing class. And um, one of their students with a hearing aid heard okay. So they were in orchestra. Well, then the other students in the class wanted to do it too. And I'll be quite honest, it got me out of the lunch duty. So we had the hearing impaired orchestra. They came in. You wouldn't, you know what our motto was? It sounds but, good to us. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, everything was unison. 
-hmm. We did some with the bow. It was interesting to me because some of them could hear the violin better than they could the cello and some the opposite way. So I was, I was quiet. I was like, really? You can hear this better? It didn't hurt anyone. It was all school instruments. At the end of the year, we played Mary Had a Little Lamb, some with a bow, not great. Some just using the, you know, picking method, the guitar method for their parents. And they loved it. And I got to tell you, when I left that position after four years, that was the hardest class to say goodbye to. Sure. And their teachers were like, no one else is going to do this. And I'm like, but try. Yeah. You know, you know, put yourself out there and try it. It's interesting. Like I said, I was like, really, you can hear this, but not this. Because, you know, every once in a while, someone would say, I don't hear that. And you're thinking, I know, but they can hear different things. Mm-hmm. And just the geeky part of, you know, being a musician, the physics of it and all that, I'm like, that is so cool. So I learned as much from them as I hope they learned from me. So try things. Um, student with limited mobility in a wheelchair but wants to be in band, you know, it's not going to continue. Maybe they can't do all of it because of physical limitations. But can they play the bass drum on the, with the second, the second tier, you know, sixth grade band? Uh-huh. And they just want to play. Yeah, they don't necessarily they don't necessarily want to win a grand championship. They just want to play. They they probably can't come to the concert or something, but just, they you know, might, but yeah. they might, they might not. But just, yeah. you know, try. Mm-hmm. It, it won't hurt you. They will love it. Um, the legal the legal things that we were all worried about. That's when it gets to testing. And mm-hmm. the legal issue comes when you, when somebody comes in and goes, hey, this student has autism and they were in the band. You go, oh, not my band. Yeah, then you get a lawyer, an advocate, sure. the news, the superintendent. Yes. 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 If you say, okay, well, how did that work in your old school? What can we do? Great. Mm-hmm. Um, and just try it. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. And I, I recommend, you know, it can't hurt. And quite honestly, a lot of the parents are pretty open and honest. Like, heck yeah, let us try chorus. And then if they stand up on the um, for the concert at the end of the year they're on the um risers i almost said podium and then all of a sudden they look at the crowd and they get off of the riser and walk out as long as something you know they don't leave the building or anything mom's happy because they got to try they made yeah. it on stage you know and maybe next year they'll sing a little and then they'll leave you don't but know that's that's what i was thinking about your marching band illustration is probably the grand championship's not going to be the first time that that child's been with you. They, they should have been with you all season and they have their thing that you've already worked out. And that leads us to, like I said, you know, what did I just do? Wimberly has a question. Yes. Um, Yes. So when I conducted chorus in the elementary school level, I had a Mm -hmm. boy with autism. It's not really a question. It's just a story. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, he sang, we were singing All I Want for Christmas is You, and he had that opening solo, and he sang it for the Covington Square in front oh, wow. of thousands of people, and just, oh gosh, goosebumps. Mm-hmm. Couldn't be more proud of him. And like, uh, you know, the, the special ed class that was in that trailer way behind in the back with the, you know, barbed wire around it or whatever when I was growing up, <laughs> you know, you know, those kids, a lot of it, you're like, oh, that's special ed. Someone with a, you know, in a wheelchair walks differently. You know, sometimes it's, and sometimes you just don't know. Just let them be a kid. And um, I've, I've enjoyed including music in my special ed class. And I enjoy it when my kids go to specials. Now, and again, most of us are honest about it. Right now with the second grade music teacher, with them using instruments, oh, heck no. Let me just tell you the destruction that would fall in that. And, you know, we're working on following directions. We're working on paying um, attention spans of more than two minutes doing preferred activities and stuff. So it's just not appropriate. Can we do it every once in a while if they're doing something fun? Mm -hmm. But you just got to know. That might be a motivator. Yeah. That might be a motivator that if you can do this thing and if you can control yourself, Mm -hmm. then we'll get to go play instruments. You know, once you show me that we can do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, if, if, if it's if they're in your class and you're having trouble, ask the special ed teacher or the para that's there. Um, those little um, picture things that I have, um, I learned very early into teaching special ed. If you need one, make like 70 because you're sure. going to lose them. So, hey, I need a, a little sign with a break card. We got one. The duct tape. Yeah. Um, I was thinking maybe some space. What, what do I do for this? That'll, you know, um, that'll help as well. You know, ask. 
some things are kind of quirky. I recently gave a picture, a teacher, I have this picture, this pillow that looks like the monkey's paw knot, but you can put your hands in it and squeeze and it's a little bit weighted. And so, you know, the boys in fifth grade that just have to punch a wall, well, now he can squeeze the pillow and it's, it, since it presses back, sort of, that helps. You know, it doesn't have to help for everybody, but it does. Mm -hmm. All right. Shay has um, to leave. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, anybody else have questions? This is our question time in my. If you do think of something, um, once I finalize the PowerPoint, I will send it to um, Dr. Davis as well as my email if you have a question. Again, I'm not an expert. I can't tell you, oh, you do this. I can give you an example. Maybe we can work something out or at least tell you who you can ask or find out the information. Outstanding. I also wanted to tell you that I'm a Southern Miss alum as well. So, woohoo! <laughs> SMCTT, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Wonderful is music it, program. Is it bad that I just heard H O T T O G O? <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, hang on. So, Solange said, What a beautiful presentation. And Victoria has a question. Victoria, okay. go ahead. Um, yes, it's not more of a question, but I remember in a previous middle school, the access students from the middle school um, had, they were the self-contained class. Mm -hmm. So once a week, they, um, the choral teachers, they had two, would include the middle school access students and then yeah. the high school access students for 30 minutes for their own music class. Yeah, uh, they were not able to participate with the gen ed students. So they were in the access program uh, and they put songs. They did colors. They did mm -hmm. like four different colors for quarter note, um, half note, eighth notes and um, a whole note. And then the kids like they learned choreography as best as they could um, saying as best as they could. They had the teachers there and the paras actually for the 30 minutes. It was once a week, every Thursday. Yeah. Um, uh, and then at the end of the school year, um, during the Christmas time, and then in the spring, those students, those access students, um, put on a performance for the yeah. rest of the school in the auditorium. Yeah. Um, now, technically and legally, if, you know, your school was audited about not following IEPs, the fact that they're in a separate class can get a little gray. Usually it's like, well, I am combining multiple grade levels in this. And again, that's one of those things that, you know, the police are not going to come get you because you're accommodating and trying to include. Would yes. we like them to all go like my students? Would I like the kindergartners to go with the kindergartners and this and that? Yes. But if it doesn't work, then we can work on something. And that would be, a, um, you know, like like we said, creating a class for them is great as well. I do have my pop quiz if everyone is ready. And I have prizes first. And if you'll help me see who writes first or um, you'll just type it in the chat and I promise to be fast. First question for a pack. Oh, wait, you can't see the back. A pack of cards with cat facts on it. What does L-R-E stand for? All right, Victoria, do you know? Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> least least restrictive environment awesome yes i will make sure that dr davis gets these is, are, is victoria the only one left I, yes she is uh, oh okay so when it comes to least restrictive environment um we because that was an access program and in the same middle school i was a triad para um mm -hmm. we did have one student um uh, because uh yes we tried to include the student in the connections classes um, but some of the, for that particular, we had several, but for one particular student was had to be removed and it was more mm -hmm. because of the extreme behavior. It was a lot of kicking other students. If a student, even if a student was sitting in front of the student and the student was like squatting in their chair, the student would still accuse the person sitting in front of them of being in their personal space. So the student would like scream, hit, bite, throw things. Yeah. So it was all, and we tried it like first semester. Um, I wasn't there first semester. I was just told when I came in mid semester and then we tried it again in a different connections class and it just, it didn't work. Um, Sometimes it doesn't, you know, but you have to try. My did. students like that. 
you know, we, I, we we line up with everyone. And if they get in there and immediately go and hit someone or try to hit someone, we turn right back around and go. And that, but that's an individual, you know, student issue. Like we already knew that it was a problem. Yeah, like it so wasn't like they just, you know, they're in the class and all of a sudden just, you know, blew up or something. It's like, this is something we're working on. But it, yeah, so it doesn't work with everyone. You know, yeah, in my fun. class of seven, probably at least twice a week, there's someone that gets to sit with me for PE and stare at a wall yeah. because they, you know, did something they weren't supposed to. Okay. And then, I mean, we tried. They, from when I was yeah. told in mid semester, that they really tried. And it was just where the classroom was having to, even with the paraprofessional and the teachers mm -hmm. coming in and helping. Yeah. It was a matter of, it was just, it was too disruptive. And so they modified, I guess they just changed it to where whatever activities they were doing in art or um, mm -hmm. and the others, like they had technology, then the art teacher would say, these are the materials and this is a project that we're working on and you can mm -hmm. uh, help the student during that time. Yeah, um, we do though, you know, schedules are schedules and, you know, lunch is lunch. I have some flexibility. If we're not feeling it that day, we can move on. Um, if we were going with second grade and that's, it's a really big or really active second grade class, we can change. Mm -hmm. You know, most of um, special ed classes have that ability to kind of fudge around with some time and placement. Okay. okay. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, I think that was it. I know they did. It was part of my observation when I did um, exceptional child's course with Dr. Holmes Davis yeah. um, in the spring. And it was nice just to go in um, to their, to the access music class. Um, yes. And they were really happy. Even we had their different levels um, of disabilities. There was one student in a wheelchair, mm -hmm. um, really could not move. It had very restrictive um, mobility. So this student kind of just nodded, you know, and yeah. it was part of their participation. It was a high school student. It was part of their way of enjoying they enjoy it participating in what they were doing yeah, just just whatever you're able to do mm -hmm. is you know just try it i mean obviously you know the 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 40 grand bassoon here hold this probably not let's you know but song flute recorder okay mm -hmm. you know and if you if you toss it then 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 you don't get one boom whackers are great however you also get to hit people with them um yeah so then you don't get your boom whacker. You know, it's 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 and reasonable stuff. Yeah, sorry. Oh. I'm thinking with the boom whacker, you can reach way away from you. Oh yeah. He's touching me, he's touching yeah. But um mm -hmm. you try things. I mean, they're just kids. And mm -hmm. sometimes, um, particularly as I go on in my career, you know, my kids aren't that different than some of the general ed ones. They're not. Uh, you know, like somebody screamed and they look at uh, my class, I was like, it wasn't us. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, if, if there's an emergency call on the um, you know, the well, Miss Cote, please come to this, you know, for the principal. It wasn't us. It wasn't us, you know. So, it, you know, it, it is different. And some of it's a little more extreme. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, just they just want to be kids. Well, Miss Van Wick, mm -hmm. we are actually out of time. But thank you so much. We usually we get either music teachers who um who have a little bit of special ed or we get special ed teachers who understand music it's very rare that we get somebody with an <laughs> insider's view of both so thank you very much for you know staying with us today and and teaching us what you know and what you've experienced and thank you also for kicking off our podcast with me yeah. and um all right so y'all have a great day thank you very much thank right. you Bye. have a great day thank you